Sean Lee, the current champ. He's never been defeated. Those awesome records, including the fastest kill. He killed a guy during the last comedy. Yep, kicked the poor bastard right in the throat. I died right there on the platform. Chong Lee stood there and watched him die. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and it's time to kind of talk about some of the the issues I personally have uh, with, with comic book writing today. And one of the things that we often hear about in the comic industry is writing for the trades and how it's led to all this decompressed storytelling. And a lot of people will say that Brian Michael Bendis himself is patient zero in you know in the movement for decompressed writing for the trade stories. I, I don't know if he was exactly the first guy, but he certainly made it more popular. That idea has, has expanded and has become something different. And I don't, I don't want to take full credit for this, obviously. I was inspired by a recent video on Comics by Perch, but there is another YouTuber. His name is Venom Vlog. His name, actually, his name is Seek. His channel is Venom Vlog, and he was talking to me. We were talking offline one day about writing for the omnibus. And I, I want to talk about that today, the writing for the omnibus, these really super decompressed stories, kind of how it affects comic books. And here with me to talk about that today is my man, Yul Carter from Fantastic Comics. How you doing? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm glad you could make it. I do want to say this. If this is your first time on the channel or you've been visiting but you haven't made the leap, it's time to subscribe to Thinking Critical YouTube. Hit the bell for notifications. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this conversation. Give us an enormous thumbs down if you think we're a couple of rubes and set us straight in the comment section. Also, if you like Yul, he does have his own YouTube channel. There will be a link in the video description. At the end, you can kind of go and subscribe to his channel there as well. Now, Yul... This is actually, you know, a lot of people think that I'm really anti-Marvel and pro-DC, and I could see that. I do like DC's characters a little bit more. I'm more attached to them. I also think DC has a better collection of writers and artistic talent just overall. So I think the product is across the line better on average than Marvel. But when we talk about writing for the omnibus, it's much more of a DC problem than a Marvel problem. The reason I think that is is because when people are writing for Marvel, for the most part, you don't know if you're even going to get six issues before you get canceled or you're going to be running into the next event where you end up having to cross over and tie in and all these things. So nothing's really guaranteed. So it, it doesn't feel like they're doing these really long decompressed story arcs outside of Donny Cates. Obviously, it's, what is he like 26, 27 issues into Venom right now? It's it's one big story about uh, the arrival of Null. We've all been leading up to that for a few years now, but it's really it's over on DC where it's really happening. And it's almost all the big guys, Tom King, Scott Snyder, Brian Michael Bendis, even James Tynion, who's on uh, Batman right now and so hot. Everyone really enjoys what James Tynion is doing. He does very decompressed storytelling. Uh, have you noticed this kind of more writing for the omnibus, even more than trades nowadays? Yeah, there's a few people that I... so. There's the decompressed storyline where you don't get a lot of information in the six issues that get collected in the trade paperbacks. And then you have your omnibus, which is like, what, 30, 60, depending how many issues uh, they want to slam in there uh, of comic books in these big, big books. <laughs> um, depending on the writer, they might have like an overall story arc that they want to you know, tell in that omnibus or in their run of a comic book. So you might take something like Saga and take a look at it and say, oh, well, this is like writing for an omnibus, one really big, I kind of call it novelistic style. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm writing comic books like they're novels or this is like, I feel like Hickman would do that. So you know Absolutely. that like- I think it works really well for creator owned and original characters where it's own create. Uh, contained story. If you think about East of West, an image comic with Hickman on it that, that, that Hickman wrote that I think is absolutely excellent. That is one big ass story. It's mm -hmm. I think it's is it 53 issues. Mm -hmm. it, it's something like that. And that is one very enormous story. Where it problem kind of doesn't work is when you're talking about Marvel or DC and we're talking about connected characters and continuity and things like that. People aren't there just for the creator. A lot of them are there for for the for the character as well. Mm -hmm. So if you go on this fifty or sixty issue uh, story arc, and you know a big fan of Batman doesn't enjoy it, you're are they going to jump off? What are they going to jump back on? You know what I mean? It, you you kind of have to write it with fans of the character in mind rather than just your story and, and fans of the writer in mind. Yeah, if you don't know that, so if you start off with 
Batman number one from Tom King. If you don't know that you have to put your seatbelt on, <laughs> you might get off the ride somewhere in the middle. And that's all right. So you're right. Uh, when you, you own your own creation, you get to tell the story you want to do. And Hickman brings that over into superheroes a lot of times. Other people do that also. So Hickman, the reason why I like him on mainstream stuff as opposed to some other people is because he's just like jamming information all the time. You know, it's like every issue is important to read, even though if you don't get it. And even Hickman is a guy you have to put that seatbelt on. You have to strap in two or three of them if you want to stick around. And I have seen sales decrease as these longer stories go on in these books, even though people claim to really enjoy them, whether it be Tom King's Batman or uh, Ed Brubaker or even before that, Brian Michael Bendis' Daredevil. And the thing I want to say is on these mainstream books and these big omnibuses that everybody loves of featuring these characters is what is the one specific issue that you always think about, like, think about Daredevil, you know, the Bendis run. You know, I, I'm thinking about how he gets outed and how he, uh, as a superhero, Matt Murdock, for those of you that don't know, and they're trying to, the, the media and the FBI are all trying to, like, prove this. And he's trying to do everything to not prove this. Meanwhile, there's all this other stuff going on, and he eventually gets put in prison and I can't tell you anything significant that happens in any one specific issue. I can just tell you about my overall feeling of the entirety of the story. And that's kind of where I see a problem with writing for, if you will, an omnibus is concerned. It's like, it's, it's nothing really specific that I can really pinpoint other than this was good. <laughs> you can't talk, you can't point to that impactful comic book and be like, that was the moment when I knew this was the story for me. Right. And I guess it's just really the style of storytelling. I mean, we get into it. All, I mean, it's all nuts and bolts here. Mm -hmm. And if you enjoy this, you enjoy this. It's not a, this is not a, uh, <laughs> a critique on anybody and what they like. It's just, you know, think about Chris Claremont writing X-Men, the Dark Phoenix saga. It actually started when he started writing X-Men. And if you chart everything, that makes a nice, really big, thick omnibus that ends in like 138. You didn't but the see difference it is, coming that there's way. There's about seven individual stories along the way. And it's not, yeah. the entirety isn't the story of the Dark Phoenix. It's, it's hinted at, you're reminded of it, and then they they pay it off. Yeah, it's like you don't know it's that you're- It's a different cadence. Yeah, you don't know that you're waiting in it like you do when things are decompressed. It's like, it's like oh, well, I'm just like kind of trudging through this like they are. Whereas in, in X-Men or, you know, maybe x Men's really a great example of it because you yeah. just didn't realize that it was happening until it happened. You thought you were just reading a really cool two-part arcade story. You know, you just thought you were reading this four-issue Proteus story and you didn't realize that, uh, you know, all the other stuff was happening and, you know, there's subplots. That's the way, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Chris Claremont crafts his omnibus with subplots. Whereas new writers, a lot of times, this is their only plot. You know, there is no subplot, really. It's just, these are the things that move the one thing I'm trying to tell you to make it go forward. There's no consideration of uh, what I'm going to write after this entire storyline occurs, or even if I'll be on the book after that also. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you brought up Tom King. I remember when, when Batman number 50 came out, the overwhelming disappointment. I was outraged. I didn't have a channel back then. But, you know, I was on the Twitter spheres and I added Tom King. I was like, hey, man, this is bullshit. <laughs> and I remember he, he kind of came back. He's like, listen, you got to you got to you got to wait for it. There's another 50 issues for me to tell this story. And I, I remember I, I actually tweeted back. And I was like, another 50 issues. I was like, that's like two hundred dollars, man. It's like you expect me to pay two hundred more dollars for you to finish your Batman Catwoman love story. Like that is absolutely ridiculous, but he just in his mind a hundred issue, like sweeping arc <laughs> of a Batman Catwoman love story, and there are a couple of segues in the middle. There's like a twelve angry men story that happens for three issues, but the overwhelming majority of it is is setting up him falling in love with Catwoman to kind of explain the relationship, her leaving him at the altar, finding out that it wasn't her fault, him being very depressed. He goes and he has nine issues with the nightmares, and then eventually we get to to uh, City of Bane. 
it ended up being 85 issues instead of 100 because they, they cut him off. But it's like that. That is uh, <laughs> that's a rough. slog. That's it a slog to have to wade through. <laughs> yes. And I, I, and he is definitely using decompressed storyline to create the trades, which will also ultimately be this one long story. Is, is he even right? Is he writing for the compendium at that point? <laughs> See, I don't. Well, I, I mean, it's so weird that a person would know that they're going to be on something for like a certain length of time. People have their storyline in, in mind, and comic companies are more inclined to restart the series over these days so that you know that this is uh, Avengers by Jason Aaron and whoever the artists are on the book. And, you know, we're going to get this one really big, you know, million billion BC, you know, Avengers story that's going to affect all the characters going on now. And there's this big, big storyline that's taking place. And, you know, when it is over, <laughs> Jason Aaron's going to be gone and they'll probably restart it. And then it's Donny Cates' Avengers or whoever else it might be. I'm now thinking that everybody's vision of these characters is ultimately just like they're, this is my magnus opus of Captain Marvel. And I can't wait till this gets collected in one big volume. And, <laughs> you know, eh. <laughs> I guess it's, that's it's, how it's going. And it's not just Tom King, like I mentioned. It's some of the more popular writers that, quite frankly, are not boring in their execution. You take someone like Scott Snyder, so he's got some of the biggest, craziest ideas in the comic in the entire comic industry. Certainly, when you read his comics, they are fun to read. He's got a lot of wild things going on there. Uh, known to be a, a teacher, he's a comic book teacher, and one of his best known students is James Tynion, who's now on Batman. You just think about James Tynion's time before that on Detective Comics. Like, how long was that Tim Drake story? Was that like thirty issues? Oh, that was a long story. But it was that mm, that was rough to get through on that one. I don't even know if I did all the. Way I through. checked out. Yeah, I mean, that was a long, like Tim Drake yeah. story. Yeah, I was like, this is too much. And then think about Scott Snyder just recently leading into the Dark Knight's Death Metal. That Justice League run of his, for for the most part, is just one big ass story setting yeah. up. You know the the events in the Dark Knight's Death Metal for the like the fall of Lex Luthor. Oh yeah, and then the Justice League kind of you know uh, being pulled out of time and all that stuff. I've had like, many customers like twenty five issues. I've Maybe had many more. customers no, like that passed out on that one. You know, they're like, "Oh, it's issue twenty. I'm out." You know, and yeah, like a forty issue setup series. Like, wow. And there was a Justice League miniseries to Justice, yeah that preceded no that. Yeah. And, and then you had the entire year the villain that was happening. Uh -huh. Although that's not one giant story. Those are uh, writers picking and choosing and, and adding those components into their stories where they could have the, the secret gifts or the special gifts from uh, Lex Luthor as he became Apex Lex. But I'll um, tell you, as far as a monthly, as, as far as selling monthly comic books, uh, these uh, long storylines, people do get into them. But I question whether or not they're reading them all the way through. And I do see sales dip as, you know, the, the longer they go on. Um, because the people, problem is if you yeah. jump off, if you go, you know what? I don't like this story arc. You can't be like, well, once it's over, I'll just jump on mm -hmm. because the story never ends. Right. <laughs> you can't be uh, like, this weird two-faced story just doesn't do it for me. I'm going to wait for Bane to show back up and I'll, I'll go read that story because I like that character more. No, because it, it just keeps going like. Once you if once you made it to fifty and Tom King told you that you were basically on the hook for fifty four issues if you wanted the story. I, I promise everybody right now, if I ever get to write Batman, I'm gonna have a fifty issue arc featuring Kite Man as the villain, and you're gonna love it. <laughs> love it. But it's, Strap uh... in. <laughs> and it's it's crazy. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with these big, you know, big story arcs. Jonathan Hickman obviously does those when he does his image stories. Rick Remender's uh, Black Science or his Low, those are one continuous story arc, but those are original characters yeah. that people people that jump on the Black Science uh, image series are doing it because they're Rick Remender fans or they're science fiction fans or, or maybe they're indie fans. They're not jumping in there because they're attached to those characters or that brand already. Yeah. So you know you kind of know what you're getting into. That's what, what I think the difference is. I don't even want to say it's unhealthy, but it can be annoying as hell if you're a Batman fan and you know it's like, oh, we 50 more issues of this. 
it's one big story. We've already got the first half. It's gonna be you know, a four year. People Ugh. have such a uh, people have such a problem with reading things out of order these days, or not. You know, I mean, it's part of it is because of the way the stories are written. But I know I had a hard time reading a Hardy Boys book until I got the first, you know, the first one, even though it's not important to read it. You know, uh, I, I did eventually read Spider-Man. I started with issue, you know, 220 or something like that. And you don't have to read all of them. I would hope that comics would be written more that way. It was always exciting when there was a new team that was going to be coming onto a book, whether it was because I could drop it or I was like excited that they were coming on. I was going to pick it up at issue 17. No big deal. You can look at all of what Frank Miller did in Daredevil and say this was his big omnibus and you can even fit it in there, but it's a different style of storytelling. And it is, like you said, it's more character focused. And when Frank Miller left, you were excited to see who was going to come and take over even if it was somebody that was not as good and ultimately maybe someone that was better. You weren't going to know until, you know, Anna Senny takes over and John Romita Jr. is doing the art. Or before that, it was Dave Mazzuccelli and De Denny O'Neill, you know, and these are awesome, you know, these are people that come on the book and I, I really feel bad that, uh, well, I, I feel bad. <laughs> It, it's strange that, you know, the comics have become the way they are as far as the storytelling. And it, it's so synonymous with the creator. And at the same time, we're not looking forward to new creators taking over the books. We have to have like this whole restart and relaunch and a reimagining and a revisioning. And all I just wanted to do was have those really good creators working on the thing that happened beforehand and just kind of adding to the mythos of the character rather than just putting their stamp. You know, your stamp will come and be slammed on that character eventually, depending on what you do, not because of uh, what you plan to do. Bendis is the worst with that. Every <sighs> time he gets a new character, he, all right, we got to redo the origin. Let's, let's come up with a more important character than the one that everyone knows from the very beginning. And we, you know, we're going to add this and this and this. And all these characters are more important than anything that's ever happened. It's like, it's not how it works, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't just get to erase everything and make your stuff more important. And and that's it. You know, he did it with Avengers on Disassembled, and you can just see, you know, how he goes about doing his things. And it was very popular for a writer to come in and kill off some like no name character that everybody pretended to love after the fact. You know. Uh, like, oh, I killed Nomad off. And everybody's like, oh, Brubaker killed Nomad off. Oh, I love Nomad. Who could do that to Nomad? And nobody cares about Nomad. <laughs> and so, you know, this is a very impactful thing to show you that the villain is a really bad mother, you know? And, <laughs> uh, and Bendis just goes and says, well, you know, hold my beer. <laughs> and he just says, man, I'm going to... I'm going to destroy everything, and then I'm going to add Spider-Man and Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, or with what he's doing with Superman. I'm going to destroy everything, and then I'm going to recreate the, the things that were already there with new original characters. What do you mean, Rogel's art? It's like, that's not what happens. It's like, like, oh, he's, he's important now. It's like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, there are people that, that love these storytelling methods. I like them in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I love them with the original characters. East and West is great. Black Science is great. I think Lowe is excellent. You know, there's a lot of cool uh, things that you can do with this kind of thing. I just don't think it always works with these really known characters at DC, Marvel, even like a Valiant, you know, something where they have a lot of history. Um, there, there is definitely merit to the style. In certain circumstances, I, I absolutely love it. If if any of the viewers out here, they're like, oh, I completely disagree with you. I think it's great that you know Tom King got got an eighty five issue story arc. Well, I'm glad. I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm not, I'm not here trying to you know piss at anybody's weedies. Just because I don't like something uh, specifically doesn't mean everyone else has to. But this is something I wanted to talk about, and I, I you know we, we like to talk about comics, and I'm glad you you, know, you you've kind of seen it yourself and you have your own take on. 
Yeah, it's it, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's just a style of storytelling. It ain't that big a deal. Um, uh, it, it it feels like if you're investing that much time in the creator, you might want to do it more on their on their um, creator own things rather than them coming over on the Batman. It's nice when a creator has eighty five issues that he wrote on Batman, but you didn't know going for you know from day one that it was going to be that long. Or I have a very long story that I'm going to tell. And, you know, you know, you can kind of guess how far this book is going to go for this person. And then there's the whole restart. And, yeah, uh, creator owned. If you're following the creator, those kind of long ass stories are great. When you're doing it with the superheroes, we need a little bit more jumping on points. That's really Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. All right, Yula, I really appreciate you coming on here. This is a, a great discussion. I didn't know where this was going to go, but uh, I think this went really well. And if you enjoy what, what you brought to the table here, right now there should be an icon on the channel. I think it looks like uh, it, Hellboy, right? Oh, gosh, yeah. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. <laughs> looks like Hellboy. If you select that, you can go subscribe to his channel. I definitely recommend it. Yule's a great guy, and he loves comics. Yeah, thank you.